Good morning and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. This morning we are going to continue taking testimony on H687 and hear from Molly Mahar, the Ski Areas Association. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you to Chair Sheldon, Vice Chair Sibelia, and to the committee for giving me some time to speak to you on H687 this morning. Um, my name is Molly Mahar. I am president of the Vermont Ski Areas Association. We are a private uh, or a nonprofit trade association representing 21 alpine and 27 cross country ski areas across Vermont. Um, and ski areas uh, are a major economic driver and employer in their rural communities where most of them are located. Skiing is also an important part of the state's outdoor recreation, tourism, uh, heritage, and culture. And ski areas have successfully conserved and protected lands through master planning and careful management to benefit our state its natural resources and the environment over many decades. And I know you were hearing about uh, critical resource areas yesterday, and my testimony is more focused on forest blocks and connecting habitat and how that will affect the ski area. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Um, so ski areas are part of Vermont's working landscape and they're stewards of the land. Their managers take this responsibility very seriously and spend millions of dollars in planning and permitting to accomplish this to support the state's recreation economy. Um, we celebrated Outdoor Recreation Day last Friday, and it brings many benefits and, uh, to Vermonters and to our state, quality of life, physical and mental well-being, and important driver to help, our, to help keep our rural uh, economies vibrant. Uh, it's also a gateway for Vermonters and visitors to understand why the environment needs to be protected um, and ski areas strive to manage that environment properly and well. So people will continue to visit and the capacity to support and promote outdoor recreation uh, will be enhanced. We understand that our outdoor recreation economy depends on a healthy and thriving environment. Um, now Act 250 governs the use, development, management, and protection of lands where ski areas operate. And often other state, other state and federal land use policies govern their management as well. Um, ski areas, as a result of Act 250 and the ANR permit conditions that guide how ski areas are operated, have successfully managed lands in harmony with the goals of ANR and in support of the land, plant, and wildlife resources we seek to protect. Um, and master planning is a lengthy and expensive process for ski areas, but it's a proactive way for them to increase their certainty by creating a framework to ensure that they, their local communities, the region, and the state all have a vision and agree on the goals and preferred outcomes. Efficiency and predictability of the permitting process are very important because as we've heard many times, time is money. Ski areas must line up the capital resources uh, and complete the permitting processes in a similar time frame to then schedule project work in what are often very short construction windows due to weather and uh, permit conditions. So now I'll speak a little bit about forest fragmentation and connecting habitat. Um, and this testimony, I just wanted to note, is consistent with earlier testimony we've offered when these criteria have been uh, considered in the past. And while we see significant, significant potential issues for ski areas with the addition of forest blocks and connecting habitat review criterion under Act 250, a successful outcome would ensure the appropriate long-term protection of forest resources in Vermont while recognizing the importance of the investments made by ski areas as well. Um, H687 would amend Act 250 to prohibit development in forest blocks or connecting habitat areas unless fragmentation of such areas is avoided or sufficiently mitigated. Forest blocks and connecting habitat uh, comprise over 72% of the land area in Vermont and ANR mapping as of last August, and I understand that they have completed some new mapping um, now. Um, but I don't think this is likely to change, shows that most lands at ski areas are within the highest priority forest blocks and the highest priority uh, connectivity blocks. And as a result, these new criteria would create tremendous uncertainty for ski areas and could result in the application of these criteria in areas that are already developed and within ski areas existing boundaries, as well as uh, a prohibition on new or upgraded ski lifts, trails, and other facilities at existing ski areas, which is not our uh, understanding of the intent. Uh, the proposed definitions of connecting habitat, forest block, are, are overly broad, and some of the ele elements of significance and 
some elements of significance and size threshold should be applied to forest blocks and habitat. Existing ski area infrastructure, including trails, lifts, work roads, and existing golf courses should be included under allowed uses um, and we'd like to see a buffer of at least uh, one quarter mile surrounding existing ski area boundaries within which uh, these new criteria would not be applied. Um, I also wanted to note that the mitigation compensation multiplier of uh, times three will have an outside imp outsized impact on the ski industry and could drive uh, project costs to be prohibitively expensive. Um, we need to be protective while not prohibiting a thriving outdoor industry. And we understand that the uh, NRB and ANR rulemaking process is designed to create greater specificity around these definitions. Prior to that process, we believe that two things are critical to have updated maps to provide more accurate depictions of forest cover and land features. And number two, to convene a robust and meaningful process to bring together a broad range of stakeholders to determine how to further identify and define the location size significance of the forest blocks connecting habitat and particularly the highest priority or tier three areas to develop a draft rule. The current bill specifies just over a year to the final rule proposal, which we believe does not offer adequate time to do this work. And finally, the effective date for the proposed new Act 250 criteria should be uh, triggered, we believe, by the adoption of the final rule. Um, we think this process is necessary to result in a successful outcome, ensuring the appropriate long-term protection of forest resources in Vermont, while also recognizing the importance of investments um, by ski areas of the state. So that concludes my comments on forest blocks and connecting habitat. And I do have a couple of other comments on governance, but I'll stop there for a minute. Thank you for that. Um, Representative Sibelia has a question. Yes, yeah, Molly, will you be providing that testimony in writing for us? Yes, I will. Members have questions on first part of the testimony. Not seeing any. And I have another minute or two to, okay, great. Thank you. Work. As I said at the outset, the an efficient Consistent and predictable permitting process is very important for ski areas and for other applicants. We agree with the NRB report that a professional board could provide more oversight and guidance to improve accountability, consistency, and predictability of the overall process. The board should have rulemaking authority to establish policy to guide district commissions to consistently apply Act 250 across the state. Um, the board or the executive director should also have the authority to develop and implement clear standards and timelines for staff and the board of the, or the executive director should have the authority to oversee and ensure that staff are conforming to these standards and timelines. The current board and executive director do not seem to have this authority, which creates a significant gap in oversight and creates a lack of efficiency, timeliness, and fairness in the process. Um, we support appeals of Act 250 decisions remaining with the environmental court. The new board would have to remain neutral to be able to hear appeals, which would be difficult if they're also managing the process, supporting and advising the district commissions and establishing policy. Environmental court judges bring neutrality and the necessary ability to apply the laws to the appeals process. And we recognize that the appeals process has been slow, but this could be solved by giving the court more resources. And then finally, um, the NRB report also recommended streamlining permitting processes at the state level by having certain ANR permits dispositively fulfill all or portions of certain Act 250 criteria rather than the current rebuttable presumption that they have now. Um, this would allow for public participation in the process without subjecting applicants to multiple rounds of public participation on the same issues, which can negatively affect the efficiency of the overall process. And that concludes my remarks. Thanks for your testimony. I guess I'm curious. Uh, how often are what? How often have ski areas ended up in court um, over an Act 250 permits? Uh, I would have to get back to you on that question. <clears throat> I think it has happened a couple of times. It used to happen a lot. Yeah, it's happened rarely. I think as they've gotten <clears throat> more used to how the criteria work and. And I also, I would I think the master planning process helps a lot with that. 
Can you speak to a little bit about the master planning process and the public engagement that goes along with that? Uh, there is a lot of public engagement that goes along with that at the at the local level and as well to the prior question, I think, you know, ski areas are doing a better job at doing sort of a pre-scoping um, exercise with the public to try to flush out what some of the issues may be so that they can uh, change those in their in their proposals as they go forward. But there there is a lot of uh, of public engagement when they are putting their master plan together, which gives them sort of the framework for, um, you know, what their individual projects may be. And it just makes those projects um, a lot easier to, uh, to, to move through the, the process when it's within that framework. You know, Killington's doing a pretty big upgrade right now. Um, yeah. Prior to this, what, who else is like, when was the last time a kind of a new area was added to serve a, a new lift was added? Lifts <laughs> are, are um, regularly replaced. I think the last new one was probably Jackson Gore at Okimo. I don't have the year of that off the top of my head, but it was a while ago. Yes. Any further questions? Seeing any, thank you. Oh, Representative. Stebbins. Just curious. I mean, it's uh, uh, how the businesses are doing and what they're seeing in Thank terms you. of such little snow and yeah. rain. And mm -hmm. then, yeah. Yeah, it's challenging. Um, the ski areas have been working hard on their uh, operational efficiencies, particularly when, when it comes to snowmaking. Um, and we are leaders in the industry here in this state uh, in terms of, you know, being able to work with Efficiency Vermont on that type of thing. Um, but it is challenging for sure. Um, you know, we, I feel like we hadn't seen a lot of changes until like really the last five years. I feel like we've really seen market changes. And while it's not really shrinking the, because of snowmaking, we're not shrinking the length of our season, but, you know, we're certainly having to rely on it a lot more to get through some of these, um, the uh, inconsistency of, of the weather. So, you know, it was a tough start. To, I mean, the start of the season was, was quite good until Christmas when we had that, you know, all that flooding rain, which was horrible. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's been the, the holiday times until we're challenging up until this week. We actually got some new snow in front of this week, which is a big week for our ski area. So we're hopeful that, you know, we'll see some more snow as we head into March. Typically March is a, is a, a good snowy season. Although I'll note the uh, weather at the beginning of February really seemed a lot like March weather to me, you know, those sunny days and the cold nights and, and uh, which is great. I love March, but not in, not in the beginning of February. So um so thank you for asking that question. It's yeah, it's been a challenging year, but I'm hoping that the law of averages will give us a good, good finish. Representative Sibelia. Molly, uh, with climate change and more water, we are seeing um, more frequently, more frequent damaging um, impacts, particularly in well, just everywhere. Um, which where I live can be really uh, overwhelming for. Uh, for our rural communities. One of the things that I have noticed, um, and I'm not sure that the committee appreciates, um, is the role actually that um, these huge institutions um, end up playing sometimes in their communities. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you want to speak to, uh, you know, <clears throat> speak to any examples throughout the state. Uh, sure. Um, Ski areas are, are a bit unique in that they have a lot of different pieces of equipment and a lot of staff with differing um, <clears throat> skill sets. And, you know, they certainly often have heavy equipment and things like that. So they are able to help uh, their communities recover, you know, clear roads, um, house people that may be displaced because of flooding. We saw that happen 
Um, last July with Smuggler's Notch in particular, they were able to, to get some folks out of Johnson and Cambridge and, and get them up to the ski area, um, provide transportation and then, you know, and, and uh, put them up while, while that was all unfolding. Um, you know, ski areas are, are integral parts of their communities and they exist because of their communities. And so, you know, they certainly like to, to give back and to, to help, um, you know, whenever they, whenever they can especially when we're having a situation like the drastic flooding. I mean, you saw what happened in Ludlow too this past July. Unfortunately, there are only a handful of ski areas that were negatively impacted um, and ski towns. Uh, it could have been worse, uh, but it was still pretty bad. I have um, experienced it multiple times in my region, including in July, with uh, some of my communities that were, some of our folks were damaged. We saw the Stratton found the defendant coming out to help folks always. Uh, during Irene, saw housing of National Guard and others. I think sometimes we don't realize the role that institutions of this size play in places where there are huge gaps. And, capacity and isolation. So I'll make sure we connect all of the dots. Representative Tori. Thank you, Molly. Um, just a quick question for you about summer and some of the offerings that we're starting to see at ski areas outside of skiing. Uh -huh. I know Sugarbush has pretty robust um, offerings in the summer. Are you seeing trends like that? Yes. State? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Ski areas, um, you know, the winter will continue to be the lion's share of uh, revenue opportunity, but we're starting to see the portion that summer plays increasing. And I think it's important for ski areas to be able to have sort of that critical mass of, you know, family activities that can keep a family there for a day or a couple of days. Certainly seeing the resurgence of mountain biking in several of our ski areas like Sugarbush, like Killington, Mount Snow um, have made great strides in becoming mountain biking destinations in there. It's changed a little bit though, in terms of it's not just the downhill, you know, total adrenaline, there's more building of cross country trails, more, um, more trails for families to be able to experience it as a lifestyle sport, much like skiing is. So yeah, the ski areas are very focused on, on summer development. And they also um, host, uh, you know, weddings and corporate gatherings and things like that. So that's, that's a big part of their summer business too, or many of their, many of the ski areas summer business. Thanks All right, again. Thanks. We will invite our legislative council, Alan Tchaikovsky. Good morning, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. Uh, today I am here on draft 4.1 of the strike all amendment to H687. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, where's 4.1 coming from? I don't believe we've had a committee discussion about 3.1. Four point one is coming from work that um, followed up on. Well, we walked through the last forty pages of three point one, <clears throat> the end of last week, Thursday, I think, um, and then the language that was uh, incorporated in those forty pages over the weekend was worked on by some of the proposers of it, Charlie is Baker and um, Chris Cochran and Seth that try to mesh it more fully into draft 3.1. And that is primarily, those are the changes you'll see is just to make it line up better than it did. So I would just note, Madam Chair, I appreciate um, work happening outside of committee. Uh, I would also note that I'm working really hard outside of committee and I spent a significant amount of time transferring my notes and concerns and questions from 2.1, which we didn't discuss as committed to 3.1 over the weekend and yesterday. And now we have a new draft. And so I find that challenging to follow along. And so I'm not sure how to handle that this morning. Uh, 
personally, it would I would appreciate maybe 15 minutes to again kind of look through my notes, which are extensive <clears throat> on 3.1 and transfer them to 4.1 so that I could come along with um, with Ledge Council. Um, I'm not really sure how to follow along on two bills at the same time. These are pretty big. So I'm looking for some help and guidance. How to be productive in this matter. Representative Butler? I think, I mean, what we really, what was the, what was clear after we went through 3.1 was that it didn't match. And this it, is really just it, making Excuse it, me, Representative Bongard's clear to whom? Everybody, I think. Did, did we have a committee discussion that I missed? Maybe, because we did go through those 40 pages. Um, I was here for the going through the 40 pages, but there, I, I'm just, it's really challenging. And I see that there's changes throughout the bill. So, and I understand how that can happen. Um, it's just hard to keep up so that we can be productive yeah. <clears throat> with a bill of this size. Excuse me, a little break. We'll catch up time. Um, well, I think uh, I would say it's pretty common practice that, that we look at changes as they are coming in. And a lot of the yellow that you're seeing yellow carried over from 3.1 that we didn't get to talking about on Thursday because we were focused on the addition of the last 40 pages. So I guess I would um, like to use our time with legislative council to look at those. Okay. And so then may I follow up and ask Madam Chair, um, are we just to hear from <clears throat> legislative council on the changes at this point? Um, and then come back to a committee discussion on this? No, it's anticipated that we'll have some committee discussion today. With that, we'll start walking through it. Yes, uh, one more question, Madam Chair. So will we, uh, if I may, Will we be taking questions um, as Ellen is walking through the bill, or are we to wait until she has gone through the walkthrough? We can discuss as we go through it. Uh, yeah, and so I am scheduled um, the rest of the morning and tomorrow morning. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you're anticipating another draft by tomorrow or if that this will carry over through. Bill right. tomorrow. Yeah. So, yeah, so nearly all the language that's in. So, so on Thursday, I did walk through changes that were being proposed by the Department of Housing and Community <clears throat> Development on updates to the designated area program, which is the last 40 pages of that bill, the bill. Um, they responded, I think, to some of the confusion in the, the language from Thursday and worked with that members of VAPTA to provide some edits to that, which is primarily what is in yellow today. Um, so I wasn't, I'm not sure if that, if their document with that was sent to the committee directly, but that's what I was working from. So on page one, um, they are also, they are proposing to add a reference to 24 VSA 4302 to the session law purpose section of this bill. Um, you haven't talked about this session, this in a while, so you, and the bill has grown significantly since this was drafted. So you may want to re re uh, review all the language in this section at some point. Um, I'm not sure if you do wants to add this reference to 4302 in the first sentence. So yes. Hear what it is. So 4302 is the goal section of chapter 117, the regional and municipal planning chapter that most of the work is being done in, in the later half of the bill. So the first sentence now reads, the purpose of this act is to further assist the state in achieving the conservation vision and goals for the state established in 10 VSA 2802, and that's the 30 by 30, 50 by 50. And 
24 VSA 4302, which are the municipal and regional planning goals of chapter 117. So uh, are we taking comments or questions or ahead, what are we do doing here, Mark? Yes. So in section one in purpose, um, the last line on 4.1 on line 21, um, I want to flag hearing appeals as something that I'm opposed to. Um, so the next change is on page five. Um, so this is on the... Oh. If we're marking up, I have questions on page two. Okay. So you would like to proceed now, sure. Questions like through the bill or... Sure, for now, let's hear them. Uh, on 4.1, lines six and seven, uh, the sentence, the structure established under this act would be used to guide financial investment in infrastructure. Um, I don't know what that means. Um, sure. So, uh, there are a lot of changes being made here to the, the act 250 jurisdictional triggers that are intended to encourage development in certain areas and discourage er uh, development in certain areas. Development, uh, which is sort of inherently tied to financial investment in infrastructure, or uh, it, it, there's, a, there's an inference that there is a tie. Um, Representative Bongards actually originally requested this sentence, so I don't know if you want to. Well, I think the whole the with the future land use maps and kind of what the bill is about is intended to also help in the issues of the um, of the uh, designation overlay. Uh, that's really about helping to guide state investments. So we go to the areas that we've identified as the place where we want them to happen. So I would like to flag this as an area where I would like to see more specificity or this struck. Um, section two, uh, in section two, I believe we are citing, uh, we are talking about construction and we, uh, are citing the, uh, 30 by 30 goals here and, uh, conservation. Uh, I'd like to propose, uh, in, uh, Section two, that we add in language, um, purpose language, uh, that talks about protecting and conserving the environment while supporting equitable access to critical infrastructure, electric lines, transmission, water, wastewater, and telecom. That's it for me on page two. Uh, I'm, is are we just discussing that or if yeah, members have any discussion on that? It's the, it's the only reference to that bill, so, so I'm not sure it would become the only reference. Telecom and I would certainly also intend to add in um, removing the sunset or um, moving electric lines out of the woods. Another critical infrastructure. Thank you. Okay. I mean, I think if you have, we'll, we'll keep track and we'll see how it all. It's together. That's we're still working on fitting big pieces together. Do you have more before page five? 
five, two. So on page five, there's a sentence highlighted in yellow. This was uh, proposed by Representative Bongard. So um, you are updating the structure of the board in this in the first 20 pages of this bill. Um, and this is language that you have passed previously. Um, but one thing that Representative Bongard's pointed out is that currently the board has alternates to it um, so that there are members, but then if someone is unable to serve, there are alternates that are also appointed. You have struck the use of alternates um, because this will be a semi-professional or uh, the professional but part-time board. Um, and so there's language added on page five that says, if necessary to achieve a quorum, the chair of the board may appoint a member of a district commission to sit on a specific case before the board. I think it, with any luck, it will never happen um, because three is a quorum. Uh, but I just wanted to, thinking about from the perspective of the applicant, for some reason that I can't imagine what it would be, but either a couple get conflicted out, one is sick or whatever. Um, you don't want to hold that. You want to have some mechanism for the process to move forward. And so I think just allowing the chair to appoint um, somebody from the Ocean Commission to sit in for that case would be. It would be three people would, would be unavailable. Yeah. It, I mean, it's yeah. with any luck, it will never happen. But if you're an applicant, bid would yeah. be. Representative Smith. Can the chair appoint, thank you. Can the chair appoint anybody they want? In lieu of uh, somebody being out, like his neighbor or her neighbor, or no, that has to be a district commission. Somebody, to put. okay, yeah. Representative Simmons, um, are there any risks to this? I mean, it seems reasonable to me. Um, the only thing I thought of is you, <clears throat> you may want to specify that it shouldn't be. The board will be hearing appeals. So you may want to, I mean, I think the chair would know, but you wouldn't want to appoint a district commissioner who just issued that decision and then have them serve it on that appeal, right? <laughs> so that seems pretty obvious, but I don't, so I don't know if you want to add that. That's the only thing I sort of, uh, that came to me on this. Yes. Representative Sibelia. So just making sure we're talking about the, reconfigured uh, environmental review board here. And so this sentence is necessary if that board were to hear appeals. If that board was not to hear appeals, would this sentence be necessary? Um, potentially, because you are giving them a list of other things to do. Uh, review. So if for some reason they weren't hearing appeals, they're also here uh, given the authority to review the regional plans and maps and then the designations. So this does not, this is for any official action they would take, not specifically to appeals. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, do, if this is not related to appeals, it's related to other information such as the regional planning commission maps, et cetera, et cetera. This could happen over multiple days or multiple meetings. So if a person was appointed, would they, and then the next meeting they had a full quorum of the ERB, would they drop out? Maybe. So I phrased it as a specific case before the board. And so they would be locked in for that case. Um, because potentially, yeah, depending on how they sort of structure their time, I don't know if they'll be hearing like multiple issues in the same day necessarily. Um, but if you think about the idea that someone would be co con conflicted out because they had maybe worked on a case or had an interest in something, um, you would want a replacement to be sitting in for on that whole case where they were conflicted out. Um, and then with, I, I don't know how long regional plan approvals are going to take over time. And so I think though that the phrase specific case still works or it could be spe specific issue, project. I mean, 
But yes, I have phrased it as a specific something as opposed to like number of days. Like when a retired judge hears a case, they hear the whole thing or seems seems like a little it's belt and suspenders on a very yeah. unlikely scenario. So yeah, we could. Um, so then the next change is on page nine. Just right uh, I do want to just point out for the audience that section four of this bill is 6032. Um, at some point at the end, oh, so also just to say 4.1 has not been through the editors, so excuse any typos, but also at some point, I will need to align all the section numbers um, because new sections are added in the regional plan sections. And so section 632, 6032 is the section that holds the environmental review or nominating committee. And then also you're gonna have new sections related to the process for designation approval. And so I'm gonna line up all those section numbers at the end. Um, but I think I have, I've been trying to keep them consistent, but and just in case that I have, I have bolded them in the later sections where they need to make sure that I, where I need to make sure they align. So. So on page, at the bottom of page nine into page 10 in the rulemaking section or the, the statutory rulemaking provision, the NRB already has authority to adopt rules. And then you also are giving them specific direction to adopt rules of procedure for their new cases. Um, but there's been a proposal, uh, which we, I think, talked about a little bit last week from the planners that um, instead of rules, that there be guidance for the procedure. So at, at the bottom of page nine, line 20, the board's procedure for approving regional plans and regional plan maps which may be adopted as rules or issued as guidance shall ensure that the maps are consistent with legislative intent. Um, so I can't, I can't remember if you heard, if you heard specifically from, or if I've just been. You just help us understand the difference between rules and guidance in this. So rulemaking is a pretty um, formal procedure established in statute of all the steps that a, a body needs to take to adopt rules and it does typically take eight to 12 months to, to adopt rules formally, um, whereas guidance does not have that same stricture and can be issued fairly quickly by an agency. Would rules be more obligatory? Um, well, in this instance, it's an interesting question because this is for the procedure. So um, it's the board's own process. Um, and this is kind of an, un an unusual. So I don't, so the only thing I can think of off the top of my head. So right now, I don't think the state downtown board has rules <clears throat> for how they approve designations. I think they just have a guidance, like a procedure in guidance. So this is a similar parallel situation where it's review of something um, and the procedure for how that review and approval happens. So I think it could happen through guidance. Um, rules are definitely more formal and have a defined sort of um, public process element and review by LCAR and therefore take much, lo much, a uh, much longer to do. You could um, structure it with interim guidance if you want until they mm -hmm. Um, adopted rules formally, but it, that guidance definitely happens much more quickly and can happen sort of at the mm -hmm. agency's discretion. So guidance, my question is really around consistency over time. And so guidance could be changed week by week. We could get different guidance this month and then next month and then the month after that without any kind of public engagement process or formal process. And, yes. And, 
And why was this added? Sorry. Uh, the planners requested that there potentially wouldn't be time to can, can I can I oh uh, Charlie Baker. Yeah, sorry, uh, for the record, uh, Charlie Baker here from uh, yeah, the Vermont Association of Planning Development Agencies. I think um, in our testimony, I think uh, last week, two weeks ago, I can't remember now, but we were kind of uh, requesting this because we felt like the statute was clear enough. So that's really when you use guidance, when there's enough detail in the statute that you don't need to defer the rules to rulemaking. The rules are in statutes, and that's how the downtown program works now. That's how the regional plan process works now. Um, and that's why we're giving you a lot of detail about what the future land use areas are, how they're described and the criteria so that there's enough definition in statute that hopefully rules aren't needed. But I think there's a May statement here. So I think it kind of depends on how specific statute gets us to the line. So uh, I would like to flag this here. Um, issued guidance, uh, one of the things that I'm really looking for is um, improved, um, significantly improved consistency throughout the state. And um, so I, I'm not really comfortable with guidance at this point. I want to see public process. So it's just so I, I, guidance is used by agency. Uh, Housing community development uses it, um, and it's helpful, and it's um, it's able to it's able. It's a tool to help communities and um, know what's going on because otherwise, it can the rulemaking process can take a long time, and guidance uh, has its role. So and I think it's usually yeah. it's a it's a constructive, helpful tool to make the wheels turn properly. So we just need to when we get to yeah. Can decide if the statute's clear yeah. enough, yeah. and come back. Guidance or rules? Rules are necessary for the procedures of. Um, and I'll just quickly clarify something I just said. So there, the Administrative Procedure Act does have a statute on issuing guidance, and so it doesn't require the same formal steps as rulemaking, but it does require that um, an agency publicly maintain. Um, their guidance documents and that they updated them with any changes or deletions um, and that they're indexed and recorded and dated, that they publish these on their website and make them available to the public. Um, and so there is some statutory guidance on, <laughs> there is some statutory information on how an agency should adopt guidance and how they have to maintain it, but it is not nearly as formal as rulemaking. Representative Stevens. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I guess formal, I understand that, I mean, rulemaking is a big, large process. So I can understand if the statute is specific enough why you could just use guidance. But going to the public process piece, I mean, if an agency posts something on their website, that is not necessarily um, really communicating to the communities that may or may not be impacted. So. My question is, uh, does guidance, I, I guess I'm not as concerned about the formality, but does it have a level of public process to it? No. Okay. Madam Chair, I would love to see at some point um, how we could talk through the public process piece. Um, in this bill, where it fits, how it fits, how it relates to what ANR is already doing, yada, 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 at some point. Yeah, I mean, I think that needs to, we need to talk it through while we're yeah. walking through it. So, um, but I uh, just lost my time. So, the board that we're standing up is um, subject to uh, the open meeting law, correct? Um, yes, but they will be a quasi-judicial board. And so they will have the ability to go into executive session for uh, private discussion on their just deliberations. Deliberations on everything or appeals or? Um, I think just appeals. No, 
things like this, they would have to do an open discussion, establishing their procedures. Hmm. Um, I don't know. That's it. I'd like to know the open meeting laws application to the board as we've established it here. Yeah, following up on Representative Stebbins um, comment on um, your preference dealing with these, I have a dozen, a dozen plus at this point comments about the overall general things that I want to see in the bill. Do you want us to hold? So I haven't incorporated those into specific places in the bill. Um, you know, they're kind of overall big picture things. Do you want that to be held till the end. Do uh, you want those now as, so we can think about them as we're going through? Can you bring them up when they're relevant? Um, <clears throat> they're kind of overall process um, pieces. So um, I can try to, um, as I said before, it's been really difficult to kind of <clears throat> grapple with this bill. Yeah, well, if they, and then we can do it at the end if they haven't Great. come up. Um, all right, so then the next change is jumping all the way to page 37. Change on page 12. Um, or not a change, but a comment on page. Well, let's make sure it's 12. Six, it's page 13, um, under H. So this is talking about, um, so this is changing the types of appeals that the Natural Resource Board would hear. I think previously it was they may hear appeals on fee refund requests, and we've changed this around decisions. And so just, I probably will not be consistent throughout the bill and identifying all of the places where appeals. Um, but I, I would say, again, here I would be opposed to this change and opposed to moving appeals at this time to the board. Okay. 13. Under J, it's still on 13 under J. Oh yeah, and sorry, I inverted J and K to be more logical. So the, the language hasn't changed, but uh, J was planned growth areas and K was regional plans. And so I swapped those because the regional plan review would Potential probably happened before the growth area. Okay. Um, so in J then, um, my question is, um, what is the, and I, I, just another general comment. So we had highlight in um, version 2.1 that didn't carry to 3.1. We have highlight in 3.1 that hasn't carried to 4.1. And so we're kind of losing the changes as we go and haven't had committee discussions. So I'm trying to, that's another reason why I'm trying to incorporate my comments here. Um, so between regional plans and the future land use maps, I'm not clear on the difference between those two things. Um, so a regional uh, plan contains the maps, the maps are part of the plan. And 24, 43, 48A is? The statute that establishes what elements are required and that language is included later in the bill. Okay, so this is saying that the board is going to look at the regional plan, and make sure it complies with the elements that are required in a regional plan and the future land use maps, which is a proposal within this bill. So the, re, 
regional plan maps already exist and already are a required component. Yeah. And they are discussed, the elements for both of those things are discussed in 4348. So yes, the board would review for compliance with the future land use maps already exist. Yes. So this is transferring. Who did this before? Who reviewed this for compliance before? Nobody. Yeah. Representative Stockton. Okay, if we're going to be going to page 37 next, I comment around um, the definition of forest blocks on page 36. Let's talk about that now. Let's see if anyone has a comment before that. It's yours on page 35. 37. Okay. Yes. Anyone, do I hear anything before page 35? Let me get there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> page 34. Is, um Transition revision authority, section 15, it was 3.1. Page 34. Um, so I would just like to come back to this section. Um, oh, section 15? Yeah. Okay. So um, I support transitioning um, to a professional board and not the appeals. So I just want to make sure that we, if if uh, the committee goes with something that is a hybrid of those two, something besides that we have that properly staffed. I don't know if we didn't have appeals, but it's still in the current set. I guess I want to hear from anybody. Hey, Representative Sackowitz. Yes. <clears throat> so when I was looking at the the definition of forest block. So it's still on page, you know, on page 36, line six. I found myself really struggling to have a good sense of what this is really meaning or referring to. So I did a little bit of research and I found out that um, fairly recently ANR has also had some trouble um, with the term forest block as, as has been used in uh, some other recent documents. And um, and so they, they came up with a recommendation in a different context um, to, to address um, concern over how to interpret the term forest block. Um, and, um, and we also found a definition of forest block in Vermont conservation design. Um, and, um, and one of the things that, that ANR had also um, proposed is, um, is to define um, forest blocks using a definition that the U.S. Forest Service uses, and to, to, to sort of cut to the, the chase, I, I um, sort of put a couple of these things together with, with the intention that is in the bill to come up with a, a new definition, which I, I think would be a little more clear and detailed. Would you like me to read that to the committee? So my definition would... would um, would read as forest blocks are areas of contiguous forest land and also may include other natural communities and habitats, such as wetlands, ponds, and city and cliffs. Forest land is land at least 10% occupied by forest trees of any size or formerly having had such tree cover and not currently developed for non forest use. Lands developed for non forest use include areas for crops, improved pasture, residential or administrative areas, improved roads of any width, and adjoining road clearing and power line clearing of any width. Forest blocks may include recreational trails. So that's the definition that I came up with, which I can send to Ellen if that if, uh, seems like that's a good idea. And I also, um, in terms of, of thinking about the, this definition. Okay. 
Um, can I just ask a little history on the definition? Because we've used it in the past in statute, and where can you just remind us where else we've already codified the definition of gross block? Oh, I don't, I don't know if there's like we back one seventy one or we. Is that the in uh, Title Twenty Four, <clears throat> Chapter One Seventeen? There is a requirement that municipalities include forest blocks on their town maps. Um, and so, I don't know if there are any other statutory definitions. The definition that's in the bill currently was the definition that came from um, the discussion in previous sessions of the H233 language that this committee has passed out before. Um, and so in, in Title 24, Section 4303, forest block means a contiguous area of forest in any stage of succession and not currently developed for non-forest use. A forest block may include recreational trails. You could understand a forest block could mean anywhere from a five acre parcel. If you've got a forest block and it's 800 acres, Shouldn't it specify maybe in a parenthesis of some sort that this forest block that is being discussed is 800 acres or 1,200 acres or 60 acres so that everybody would understand what a forest block is? So I got distracted by a technological blip. Can you just say the very beginning of your point? I don't know if I can. <laughs> I think you're talking about minimum size. Are you like setting a well, minimum? There's a 20 acre minimum size. So there's no specification on minimum size here. I think people should know what a forest block is. You know, if, if there's going to be a discussion about uh, an Act 250 incident or whatever that may arise, I think the, the person outside of the area of Act 250 that doesn't know a lot about it should know what a forest block is in a simple explanation. Am I right or wrong? So I will just say um, language has been added um, a couple pages ahead of this to direct the NRB to set a minimum size um, in the rule. So that's one way to do it. Um, Representative Sackowitz, I was just going to see if I could find it quickly, but do you know if when ANR, I think you were referring to the PUC rulemaking, um, when ANR was looking at the definition of a forest block, do you know if they had a minimum size? Well, well, I there, the PUC rulemaking established that clearing of more than three acres of forest was a significant impact. So I, I was wondering though if they set the minimum size of the forest block that would be <coughs> have to be cleared. Did you not? Like okay. Not that it's not there. I didn't come right. Yeah. So I I don't know either off the top of my head if they did include that. That's in the net metering. Um, but I can I can look and see if they did. <laughs> and of Stebbins, then Sibelia. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> Representative Sackowitz, uh, as someone who needs a little more time, you thank you for reading it slowly. But <laughs> first, still, it was one time uh, narrative. 
Can you explain a little bit more um, specifically how your proposed language clarifies more fully than what's here? Like where the differences are, yeah. just so I can understand that more. Yeah. Can I just ask my question? Because I think it builds off of this, which is we're referencing number 46, right? Mm -hmm. The definition. Yeah. Okay. Um, I well, I guess there was there was two two parts. One was that I, I found myself reading the definition and not being really having a clear sense of, of what that what we were really talking about. Mm -hmm. Um not, not as in as much detail as I would like. And then um and then yeah, and then the other part would be the, the detail I, my the definition that I'm proposing um uh has more detail as, as to what we're what we're referring to. So I guess there'd be those those two parts, just the phrasing of it and also and structure and the amount of detail it goes into in terms of defining what a forest block would actually be. So I'm gonna ask if you would just email that to the committee and we can Absolutely. then I'll have some time with it and look at it more closely. Representative Sibelia. That was be my request. And Ellen, where's the rulemaking that you mentioned? Is that coming up in or... um, so oh yes, it's um no, it's on page 40. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to it. Yeah. So, on page 37, um, <laughs> so section 20 is amending the Act 250 criteria to add a new criteria for forest blocks and habitat connectors. Um, and so it's adding a, it's adding a subsection heading to criterion eight. Um, so first you have a choice here because, uh, currently only some of the act 250 criteria have headings. So the editors would prefer either all had headings or none had headings. Um, so you can either strike the language on section on line six if you'd like, or you can leave it. And then also Representative Bongard's uh, suggest it previously read ecosystem protection. Uh, and so leaving it protection. What's that? Not really leaving protection after our conversation. Like it's a almost a distinction of the difference. So mm -hmm. Well, so I don't know if you want it. So there, he proposed changing it to ecosystem functionality. I wasn't. I was not clear if that was a, ch a request to change or not. So it's highlighted here. You can either strike the whole thing. You can put it back to ecosystem protection. You can make it forest blocks, habitat connectors. Um, it's just supposed to be for reading assistance. Now is not usually how we refer to it. Function. Sure. And I'll, I can't even protection spot if that's okay. Representative Sabina. Yeah. Um, so this is a more overarching comment. So sections 19 and 20. Um, I would want us to look at in the context of a much broader implementation discussion um, timeline, which is a broad comment that I have that how this work will be done. So, related, I, okay, so related to when it might go into effect. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I would. I would say we just leave it ecosystem protection and move on. All right, um, and so then on page thirty nine, this is. Um, potentially not a substantive change, but previously criterion 8C was connecting habitat 
uh, as a protection from fragmentation of connecting habitat. Title 24, uh, I was reminded, uses the phrase habitat connector. And so again, um, on municipal town maps, you are they are required to map forest blocks and habitat connectors. And so having um, the consistent terms probably makes sense. So I changed the phrase from connecting habitat to habitat connector. It's that much easier for people to understand. It makes sense. Although I think also is this this is where we should talk. I think consistency is a good idea between these sections or something on this. But I also think this is where we need to have the conversation about testimony we've taken on undue adverse effect. Right? And so sure. Looking okay. for that language right now. Sure. So on pages um, 38 and 39. Uh, there are two new criteria. Forest blocks is 8B and habitat connector is 8C. Forest block fragmentation requires avoid, minimize, mitigate. And for habitat connector fragmentation, it is just avoid or uh, minimize fragmentation. No mitigation option. We've taken some testimony kind of in both directions, but Alan, I wish if you could help the committee understand the legal difference and then how our words affect those, what, what we're doing right now. Oh, I wish you were me. I did a, a PowerPoint on this last year. I didn't to warn you. <laughs> um, so I do have a PowerPoint that I have done because we've had this conversation every year. So uh, there, are a, there are 10 criteria of Act 250. Um, they all use slight, they they use a few different phrases to establish what a uh, applicant needs to demonstrate in their application. Many of them use undue adverse impact. Some of them also use unreasonable uh, as to what the impact is going to be. But then also there is a standard in 9B related to the protection of primary agricultural soils that sets up a different standard, which is avoid, minimize, mitigate. So um, currently under the other parts of criterion eight, it does use undue adverse impact, which is um, undue adverse effect, sorry, undue adverse effect, which uh, there is court precedent on how to interpret that. So it's a two-step initial uh, uh, assessment, which is, is there going to be an adverse effect on the resource, and is it undue? So it does allow for initially some adverse effect to happen, but there is then the question of whether or not there is that impact is undue, and so whether or not it's too much, and so whether or not the applicant has taken any steps to reduce that adverse effect. So I'm doing this all from memory. Um, I can get you more specific information on how that is evaluated and how it's been reviewed by the courts. Um, but that is a two-step where some adverse effect is allowed, but there has to be, it can't be too much and there has to be steps taken to reduce it. Avoid, minimize, mitigate is a much more uh, sort of specific standard that has steps as in how the applicant needs to demonstrate they are addressing the negative impact they're having on the resource. And so it is currently used for primary agricultural soils. Um, and so it does say first, the applicant must demonstrate that they will avoid the negative impact. And then only if they're unable to avoid it, that they then seek to minimize the adverse impact they're having. And if they can't minimize it, then they are allowed to mitigate that impact, either by conserving something elsewhere or paying a fee that would lead to the conservation of the resource elsewhere. Um, so it is a slightly different analysis, and it does 
provide more information, I think, in some ways of what the, the applicant actually has to do uh, in their application to demonstrate how they're seeking to reduce their harm on the resource. So just um, making sure that I'm clear, Habitat Connectors, we have avoid and minimize, and Forest Blocks, we have avoid, minimize, and mitigate. And so how big is a Habitat Connector? So like Forest Blocks, you don't set a minimum size in the... <clears throat> so you, you could seek to do that if you want so i don't i literally don't know like how big that could be is it a trail size is it like acres i, I mean i don't understand um what the scale of a habitat connect you you might have hit the lower and upper boundaries um but so so the one thing, I'm sorry, I just want to go back to the structure and the difference that we're doing right this second. So undue adverse effect, criterion eight has that now for A, and the interaction between the statement in line seven, undue adverse effect on page 37, the interaction of what we now have, how does it interact that we now have avoid, minimize, mitigate in B? How do those legally kind of intertwine? Well, so as with all the other Act 250 criteria, there are 10, but there aren't really 10, there's 32. So that paragraph has been interpreted to be separate, uh, specifically from actually 8A, which is necessary wildlife. So, <clears throat> so undue adverse effect is actually not even guiding 8A. Correct. What does it guide in this instance? Uh, uh, scenic or natural beauty, aesthetics, historic sites, rare and irreplaceable natural areas. So 8A is significantly dis uh, destroy or significantly imperil. Yes. Yeah, and so that's a different structure also because it, that also provides steps on analysis. Similar to the steps you described previously. So... Yeah, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different too for evaluating that. Talk us through that. Sure. Although I am not nearly as well versed in necessary wildlife, but um, so the party has to demonstrate uh, that they will not destroy or significantly imperil necessary wildlife habitat and the economic, social, cultural, recreational, or other benefit to the public from the development will not outweigh economic, environmental, or recreational loss to the public from the destruction or impairment. All feasible or reasonable means of preventing or lessening the destruction, diminution, or impairment of the habitat or species has not been or will not continue to be applied. Or a reasonably acceptable alternative site is owned or controlled by the applicant, which would allow the development or subdivision to fulfill its intended purpose. So I do think it's a similar sort of analysis ladder as what you're setting up in avoid, minimize, mitigate, but it does involve a bit of a benefit analysis um, because it asks whether there will be, um, if the benefits from the development will outweigh the imperilment of the habitat or species. Um, and so I'm actually not as familiar with the case law on this. I know there is case law on how you uh, interpret this, but I haven't recently reviewed it. Just a, just, just a question. Does does the 8A test under small I, the board can actually deny on that? And can they deny? Because if it, because they because they get to weigh and they they could therefore say no. And does the avoid 
minimize or mitigate the test or the adverse, undue adverse impact test actually allow denial or is it always shaping as best can be shaped? I'm not sure I understand. Well, can avoid, minimize, mitigate, is there, does, could the board actually deny the permit? Is there room within that for the board to deny, or does the board have to just do the best it can shaping? Um, it looks like 8A, the board actually has the authority, the clear authority to deny. So, uh, I think so. Because the question would be if the if the applicant got to the mitigation stage and then could not mitigate in under B. Um, so you haven't uh, discussed too much, but there's language establishing how the mitigation project okay. works, um, which does involve, you know, compensation for conserving force blocks elsewhere. So uh, if an applicant refused, yep. they could deny there. Um, that answer your question? We, well, we can come back to think about it more. I want to like have these handful in Vermont, I don't know the number, but a handful of like critical connecting habitats. And I just want to make sure that the language um, can give the board the authority to actually ensure that those, that handful of critical connecting habitat is um, left intact. Yes, so under C, you have removed the language regarding the ability to mitigate. Yep. And so the question, uh, the, the, develop, the applicant is asked to demonstrate that they have either avoided fragmentation of a connector or minimized it. <laughs> they will need to provide evidence that they have done something to minimize their fragmentation. And so it is a subjective question. They are unable to truly minimize because of the size of the project or whatever or the application. No report to go forward, it would, they would not be able to minimize. What would happen? Yeah, I think the authority to say no. Yeah, I think the board would have the uh, well, the district commission would have the authority to deny a permit. Although I am searching. Do you have a citation for me to look at where? Um, Pete Gill, Executive Director for the Natural Resource Board. I'll just say it's not one of the um, criteria where the uh, district commission is unable to deny. Um, what one it's are. not one where they are unable to deny. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so they, they may deny it. Um, how that will actually <laughs> play out in those new criteria, you know, is part of guidance, rulemaking, et cetera, and, and practice. And, frankly, uh, a pillow practice. So from where you said, um, we're, I think, I mean, the policy choices that we're, we've been hearing about are whether or not to kind of align the new criteria with the undue adverse impact or stick with avoid, minimize, mitigate. Um, can you help us understand how the board might interpret that now or the district commissions might be interpreting that now? Um, yeah, so, uh, I was just scrolling through cause I, I don't deal with it on a daily basis in terms of those uh, criteria. Um, but I think, um, we'd be happy to come in and talk a little bit more about that. That'd probably be most productive. 
Um, but I will say, I mean, even within our undue adverse impact standard, there are aspects of mitigation within that or uh, minimizing some of the factors that the commissions are looking at when they're applying that. So um, at any rate, I'd be happy to get into more detail, but I think we just need to, uh, it'd be more productive if we have a little time to prepare that for you. Okay, that would be great. I'd like to take you up on that offer. And I'd like to also, do you have something else to say on this topic, Representative Sacco? Yeah. Um, I'm I'm <clears throat> talking about these terms. I'm starting to feel like I don't really know exactly what we mean by especially minimize, but also mitigate. Like if you're minimizing something, like how far do you have to minimize it before it counts as minimization? And I guess I don't <clears throat> I'm just I feel like it's something that I should have been clear on a long time ago, but as we're talking about it, I'm being like, wait, what do we really mean by this? I'm not sure. So you do the one of the things that uh, a benefit of setting up this structure is that it is much more detailed than any of the other criteria that are in Act 250. So if you look at the bottom of page 38 into 39, it does actually provide information on how an applicant can avoid or minimize fragmentation. So specifically, so methods for avoiding or minimizing fragmentation of a horse block may include locating buildings and other improvements and operating the project in a manner that avoids or minimizes incursion into and disturbance of the force block, including clustering of buildings and associated improvements. Designing roads, driveways, and utilities that serve the development or subdivision to avoid or minimize fragmentation of the force block. Such design may be accomplished by following or sharing existing features on the land, such as roads, tree lines, stone walls, and fence lines. And so similar language is added, again, at the bottom of page 39 for habitat connectors. So that includes locating buildings and other improvements at the furthest feasible location from the center of the connector, designing the location of buildings or other improvements to leave the greatest contiguous portion of the area undisturbed in order to facilitate wildlife travel through the connector, or when there's no feasible site for construction of buildings and other improvements outside the connector, designing the buildings and improvements to facilitate the continued viability of the connector for use by wildlife. And so I'll also just say, like, I didn't read through the full language of either of these criteria today, but these criteria are much more detailed than other existing Act 250 criteria. And I think the intent is to provide applicants with some idea as opposed to a lot of prior criteria, I think, had to be like litigated to figure out whether or not an applicant hadn't met the standard. And so there are examples here provided in the statute that will give them some idea of what they should demonstrate and then some idea for the commission when they're reviewing the application to say, okay, has the applicant provided us any information about how they structured their site to address this and avoid these impacts? So, so someone comes with, in with a, a, a big project and it's spread out all over the place. And so they then are instructed to, to minimize. And so they then, okay, they say, okay, well, we can take this project and we can move these buildings a lot closer together. Um, and so they've minimized under that definition. But perhaps this is still like really big because the original project was really big and it's still having a really large impact but they've met this minimization. So how does how does that work then in terms of, is this really okay then? Is so it minimized? If they're under the force block criterion, they would need to mitigate any further fragmentation that they've caused despite minimizing. Okay. Under the habitat connector, if they have been, if they've attempted to minimize, but still are, you know, unable to locate it from the center of the connector and are going to fragment the connector, they potentially will need to, there may be a denial. Now, the district commission does have flexibility to attach permit conditions to permits when they issue them. And that is one of the ways that 98% of permits get issued is that they say, okay, you've done this so far, but if you were able, if we attach this permit condition that says you're not going to do X when you construct that will potentially protect the rest of the connector that may allow the permit to be approved and forward, but it will be subjective on how 
they provide their evidence to the district commission and whether or not the district commission finds that they actually met the standard. So then minimization and these other ways of making the projects better is really more about guidance to lessen the overall impact of a project and not necessarily, although in part, about whether the, the permit is, is actually granted. Because you can do all these things in a way that the law says, but still have an impact which is perceived to be too big. And that, but then that, and what you're saying then is that that analysis has a, a large subjective component to it. Well, it is fact and site dependent. So, so yeah, so, I mean, currently there's no prohibition on construction in a habitat connector. And this also doesn't establish a prohibition on construction, but it does ask that consideration be given to that habitat and whether or not there's anything that can be done to limit the adverse impact on it. It does seem as though there's a point at which like the district commission could say, no, you can't, you can't do this. I think getting back to what's between the bar that's getting at. Yes. Um, and I guess I'm trying to figure out how that really works. Like how the district commission then would decide, okay, <clears throat> despite the guidance of avoid and minimize, you still can't do that. You can't do this project because you can't come close enough to doing those things. So this is a new process that you're establishing. I do think when, if you were to pass this, then it would go to the district commissions. I do think ANR would be heavily involved in providing evidence. Uh, they probably would be involved with an applicant if there was an identified habitat cord connector on the property, ANR would probably be involved initially consulting with the um, developer to say, hey, this is a habitat connector. And if you start here, you will probably fragment it. And that would be a problem under Act 250. Here's our, the information we have on these species. Here's what you can do. And whether or not the applicant then incorporates any of that information and adjusts their uh, application to reflect that would then lead to whether or not ANR, I think, participated and or opposed the application and then provided that information to the district commission saying, here's why we think that they could do more and they haven't. So that's how it would work for these new criteria. Is that basically how it works for existing criteria now? So then I guess I just still would have the same questions about like for for projects that have happened in say in say the recent past and that would be working through other criteria. Are there projects that 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 get denied because like they've attempted to minimize, like they've done as much as they could, but then they but they're still very impactful. So they're not a good idea given, you know. The environment in that location. So the only, so there's a few different things in that question. So one, avoid, minimize, mitigate is currently only used really for agricultural soils. So I don't have a ton of background on the number of projects that have been denied solely because they have not mitigated their impacts to agricultural soils. I suspect there, there is case law on how that's played out and what denials have been. Um, but there is a lot of case law on how some other things have played out. Um, like I'm, I'm thinking of a deer wintering habitat under Criterion 8A. Um, there have been projects that have been denied because they were building it where there was critical habitat for, uh, for animals and there was no way to get around it if they were going to to move forward with the project. So <clears throat> I can't speak in depth to, have to some of that at the moment, um, but when you create a new criterion, which doesn't happen very often, 
Um, the more detail you provide, the less opportunity there is potentially for litigation. Because I think I'm kind of going off book here, but usually when a new criterion has been adopted, there hasn't necessarily been a rulemaking associated with it. And so there hasn't been as much information. And so the NRB has backfilled with guidance to applicants on what kinds of things they think would qualify. And then the district commission goes through the process of evaluating applications under the new criteria. But then a lot of it does come out in litigation. So the upside to having the avoid, minimize, mitigate is that you do provide a lot more detail than some of the other criteria that have already been established under Act 250. I know Representative Stebbins has a question, but we are really due for a break. Can I say one small thing that I want to just follow up on? There is a specific statute, 6,887, and this is going back, that lists that there are three criteria that a project cannot be solely denied for. It's traffic, education, and municipal services. So the other criteria under Act 250, you can have a project denied solely on one of those criteria. But traffic education and municipal services, a, a project cannot be denied solely for one of those reasons. Um, traffic education and municipal services. And I'm wondering if those are also linked to uh, maybe fees. Like we just, we took some testimony on traffic mitigation fees, albeit they're very small. Were there, and I think there used to be education fees paid and I don't know if ever municipal services to help communities offset the impact of those costs. There, there are <clears throat> conditions to address and, and there's a provision in here that municipalities do weigh in on those criteria and the applicant act, uh, reach out to the municipalities to ask them about whether or not the project will be negatively impacting them. So I don't, I don't know if there are any where there's specific fees, but the municipality can weigh in about permit conditions or what would be necessary to not have negative impacts on their systems. All right, let's take a 10 minute break and come back the quarter to the hearing and continue walking through H 637 draft 4.1 with Ellen Tchaikovsky. Okay, so. I think we've had a great conversation about this and that we um, probably need to do a little more thinking on it. Members have final thoughts on it. Otherwise, I'd say we move on. And we hear from the Natural Resources Board on other, how it's played out in the past. Okay. Um, and so related to this, I mentioned already on page 40. So in addition to setting up the two new criteria, 8B and 8C, there is also a rulemaking provision. And so uh, just to add another topic for consideration, this is a pretty short rulemaking section um, and new language is being added. So uh, the, the board shall final, file final proposed rules with Secretary of State and LCAR by June 15, 2025 which at a minimum shall address the minimum size required for a forest block or habitat connector. So um, you have a lot of options in designing criteria. Um, previous iterations that you have considered was um, doing the avoid, minimize, mitigate, uh, uh, doing avoid, minimize, mitigate, and not having a rulemaking provision or doing undue adverse effect and then having a much more detailed rulemaking directive on what the rules should include and address. Um, and this is kind of in between. Um, prior editions of new criteria have not necessarily included a rulemaking provision. So you have options. But the new language is being added here to address a minimum size requirement in a rule. And so that would give the board opportunity to have a public process on what the minimum size should be. So just making sure I understand what we're doing here. So this is the proposed new criterion, forest blocks and habitat connectors. 
this is the uh, rulemaking that the Natural Resources Board would put into effect in order to implement. And so that would be, so if we define it, what it, what is, they'll be talking about, like, what would the rule contain? So this is giving specifics on adding the size requirement. Um, some other things that could be addressed um, I'm trying to think you there was a, a much more detailed provision in the last sort of iteration um, there, could, detail, there was more detail in in this rulemaking section or in the yeah in prior iterations like okay not in your bill oh, okay. but like when you considered this previously so um trying to think back so it could address additional information for applicants on some of the site design elements um it could involve additional details of the what these force blocks and habitat connectors what features they have um so if I might, I think we left rulemaking in because we knew that we were not exactly, you know, we, we didn't know if we were going to do undue adverse impact and then we would really need the rulemaking or if we were going to go and avoid, minimize, mitigate. And can you remind us in the ag mitigation, like the ratios, does that come from rule the ratios? No, it's in statute. In statute, okay. Yes. Just a general flag here on rulemaking. Um, it would be great to see um, a timeline and kind of a process map for um, rulemaking throughout the bill. And yeah, I had the same thought. I think understanding so this would be the existing Natural Resources Board would do this rulemaking. Yeah. Uh, sure. As, as this is drafted. Yes, no, and I that was in, in response to the timeline. I don't, I think I, yes, can make a timeline. Definitely need one. I think we start at one. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then just on that, so there's a delayed effective date, although I have to fix it, but there's a delayed effective date on this provision until the rules are actually drafted so that, um, applicants are aware of what's in the rules so that they can have notice of them before the actual new criteria go into effect. Um, Where is that? In the effective date section. <clears throat> um, and so section, so on that point about mitigation, so section 22 then sets up the mitigation calculation for forest blocks. And it is um, very similar to the prime agriculture primary agricultural soil um, statute, which is 6093. I would just flag section 22 also as a kind of broader timeline discussion for my implementation. Okay, so the next Yellow highlighting is on page 45. I have on page 41. Line 15. Um, and I have this highlighted on 3.1. I'm assuming that's because it was highlighted on 2.1. And I don't understand. Uh, just want to walk through what this is right here. So this is this is a mitigation fee yep. for forest blocks. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and this is the calculation of that. And is this calculation consistent with other calculations of mitigation fees? 
Yeah, so currently in Section 1693, which is the primary agricultural soil mitigation statute, um, it is the language is nearly identical. Um, the difference here that you're pointing out, which is on line 15, is that currently for primary agricultural soil, the mitigation ratio is you multiply the number by a mitigation ratio based on the quality of the soil. Mm. And so it's between two to one and three to one, depending on the quality of the soil is mapped. So there isn't necessarily a comparable scaling of forest block quality. And so there was the, uh, the chair just asked to make it three as opposed to, I think the prior version had said uh, as decided in rule. And so just picking the number of three. And so the theory here, as with the primary agricultural soil mitigation is that if there's going to be a destruction or here, um, you know, cutting down of a forest block that more should be preserved than what is being lost. So somewhere else, three acres would be preserved as a, if one acre is being cut down. Okay, so those funds go to VHCB. Yeah. Yeah. They go for conservation. Yes. So they're used to purchase other land and conserve it. So the more you develop, more you can serve, you can serve three times as much. Yes. And okay, is this kind of oh look like you're questioning that? Uh so <clears throat> some of this is is tricky because uh prices, so the intent is for you to conserve three times as much. Um, it, it is sort of an open question specifically on if VHCB will be able to purchase exactly three times as much, but it is establishing that the amount that would be paid is three times. So hopefully they would be able to purchase three times as many acres, but it would be sort of going into their, their funding. Do I have a wealthy person from away? who wants to develop in a forest block in the amazing market, real estate market that is around the ski areas in my region, they will have to mitigate at three times the land value in that area. Yes. And they go through you would they go through the avoid minimize mitigate and if they get to the mitigation standpoint where they can't fully avoid uh fragmenting the forest block yes they would be required to pay a fee based on this calculation or minimize right if they if they were a, yeah so it would you would go through the process and if you got to this stage that they were unable to avoid minimize then they could opt or the district commission would opt and direct them to mitigate, which would involve paying a fee based on this calculation. So this is, this is, you know, I'm really the existing law and, and process. You know, I worry about that in terms of people with means and people without means being able to equally access the ability to use land. Uh, so I just wonder about if the mitigate is the place where that is most potentially pronounced. Like what is the most co what, 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 so be, okay, I think what would be the most costly of minimize, avoid, minimize, or mitigate? What, it, what is the most costly? Who could tell us about that? I feel like that goes to my, more to my concern around 
like what typically happens. I guess the NRB could probably. Does anybody keep statistics on that? Uh, what kind of statistics? Like on, on how, um, what is the means of addressing the criteria? Uh, do people typically, are applicants typically avoid, <clears throat> minimize, or mitigate? And what is, you know, and, and what's the order of magnitude in terms of costs associated with that? So just <laughs> thinking about who can afford to do these things, if there's if there's any difference in those three. So, Peter Gills here. Uh, do you keep statistics on? Because currently, it would only apply to agricultural soils. Yeah. So we do statistics in terms of the amount of um, agricultural mitigation fees that were assessed um, by the district commissions. Um, so we could provide that to you. Um, certainly, district commissions and Applicants, I think, um, are motivated to minimize their impacts to agricultural soils based on the fact that they would otherwise have to pay a fee for impacts to those. Um, but I'm not sure that we have, you know, that compare that you know data to show that comparison, um, which I think is what I'm understanding you're getting at, like how uh, any data to show uh, where they've actually. Um, minimized their intrusion into those um, soils. I'm not sure that we have that information in some sort of a data point, uh, but we can certainly tell it, give you the amount that's been assessed. My understanding that this is, the, that we only, this is, this is the, okay, so there are other um, factors, which we were talking about, the undue adverse impact that those, Three and and I'm aware from my region, which has ski areas, second home developers, um, you know, the ability to kind of purchase your way through um, a number of the challenges here. So that's I'm trying to understand where someone who's had their land for a long time and who may not be a person with needs where they. Are likely to feel where where we would try and target some sort of assistance or relief in the process of trying to address the criteria. So these have anyway, no flag there in terms of trying to also. <clears throat> Page 45 is the road rule. Page 40. Um, so this has to do with the existing, this is adding mapping for forest blocks and connecting <clears throat> habitat. <clears throat> Section 23? Yes. Then C is um, talking, so establishing and maintaining written procedures for updating the maps. Why would we, so what is the difference between this process and C and um, <clears throat> rulemaking? Uh, why would we do this over rulemaking for so I don't really understand uh, and see the detail of this process. So, ANR is required to do resource mapping already. This, because you're adding criteria regarding forest blocks and connect habitat connectors, um, Requiring that the maps specifically reflect that would be helpful to the public so that there is some notice um, based on ANR's information where those are. Um, they would not be jurisdictional, but relevant and could be used as part of the Act 250 process, delineating where some of these resources are. And then 
This language predates me because this comes from H233 when this committee worked on it seven years ago. Um, I think there was concern that there needed to be clear written procedures for how ANR was mapping these resources so that there was public information about how that was being done so that it wasn't opaque. So I'm not aware of ANR having rulemaking on how they do their mapping. Um, and so I'm not, I think they already have existing processes that they use when they do mapping to create the ANR Natural Resources Atlas, for example. Um, so I'm not sure if rule is, I mean, you, you always have the option to make changes, policy changes if you'd like, but I think this was an uh, attempt to get at written clear procedures so that people could weigh in also. So, and then um, <clears throat> these resource maps that the Secretary of a &R is responsible for maintaining procedures for updating them. Um, these maps, uh, those resource maps are what we are proposing that the NRB will be required to make sure the plans are compliant with? No. Okay. Help me understand what this is for then and how it relates to the regional plans and, and the overall mapping. So it is, so these are informational maps. They're to provide public information on where ANR believes that force where the existing natural resources of the state are. Um, and so these maps do already exist. This section is requiring a little more detail on specifically forest blocks and connecting habitat. I do think they have already mapped some of this um, largely. I think the ANR Natural Resource Atlas has a lot of information on it already, um, but it is specifically requiring this additional detail. Um, and I think that it would be envisioned as a first step so that um, the public was aware of where ANR believes that these resources are located, but they are not the final say on that. Because um, I don't know how fine scale they actually are, like how detailed, um, by, you know, by like property boundary they are. And so um, I think it's intended to be a public informational resource so that people who are starting their application or considering an application would have some information, but then would supplement it with the on the ground information that they then have. Um, so they're not, as we would say, jurisdictional. Um, and then how they relate to the regional planning maps is an interesting question that I will start to answer, but I think maybe better posed to the planners because Land use maps are different than natural resource maps. Um, maybe that's all I can say. Well, let me follow up then and say that it would be <clears throat> really helpful to me. We've talked about, there's a number of different types of maps that we do related to conservation design, related to 30 by 30 and 50 by 50, which are referenced in here, related to um, town plans, related to regional plans. Um, so what would be really helpful to me is to see some sort of a relationship map about how all of those maps um, come together and are dealt with in this proposed legislation, how they, how they are now and how we're proposing to change that in this legislation, because I'm not really following how all these maps come together, what's required, what's going to mean something, uh, what, you know, and I think uh, that could be helpful. Uh, did you want to ask that question to the Regional Planning Commission? 
I guess I will ask that question to the chair as a request of something that I would like to see in this legislation. I, I would like to understand about this legislation. Yep. I mean, I duly noted. Um, Representative Smith. Thank you. When, when you talk about mapping, uh, are you talking, when the state map does the maps, are you talking about mapping property lines? Or are you talking about mapping terrain? Um, so this specific section is A&R's maps. Um, so they do, they do a couple of different ones, but this is specific to resource mapping, which I think is currently captured in what's called the AR Natural Resources Atlas. Um, they do have a couple other maps that they use. I don't, I can't speak specifically to all the elements that they map on it because it's quite a few things that there's it's many different things that they map on it. So I'm, I'm not sure. I suspect terrain is mapped on it. Um, so perhaps- Are they looking more for property? Who owns the property? Or are they looking more for uh, terrain of the post? Yeah. It is the terrain doesn't change. So it is specific to natural resources, which is what the agency itself does have jurisdiction over. And so, um, you, I mean, you may want to just have A and R in here to explain it. I think they have been. I want to know what they do with that. So we've taken a lot of testimony on Vermont conservation design. <clears throat> Those are the large. Vermont Atlas, the ANR Atlas, <clears throat> excuse me, is online and available for us today to look at. Um, yeah, it's fun to play with. I guess what so my elements of Vermont, I just am going to oh, address Representative Sibelia, and I think you also in this, it's not as um, complicated, I don't think, as it may seem when we try to put it in words on the page. And so you have this functional landscape that is guided by Vermont conservation design. We've used it in previous legislation. Then you get to how that natural resource information will inform future land use maps. And that is something that the regional planning commissions have asked us for more guidance on. How do we want them to use that information in future land use maps? <clears throat> and then there are town plan maps. Um, and then from there, this is sort of a nested set of maps that increase in detail as we go down. So we have Vermont conservation design, we have future land use maps, we have town plan maps. And then you get to zoning districts that gets way more specific. And so they're building on each other and informing. Is that fair to say? Um, I'm asking Charlie Baker, representative of the planning commissions here in the room. Yeah, I think that's fair. And then when they get into permitting, they do field verification. Mm -hmm. so, yes. And, and this happens with different resources at different levels of detail now, resources that we've been more aware of. The one we like to talk about is wetlands mapping. But there was some interesting testimony taken yesterday on wetlands mapping and the effectiveness of that program. Um, and so just caution us when we use that as a poster child. Um, but that's that's kind of it. And I think if you need a graphic for that, you can... We can we can draw one, but it's just it's uh, that's how these maps are, and those are the ones we're referring to. Generally, although we don't get to the level of zoning in this bill, we stop at future land use maps, really, for the regional planning commissions. Yeah, I would love the graphic. That'd be great. I don't know if we have a graphic designer, but we'll look into it. <laughs> Uh, go ahead. Um, all right. So on page 45 is the road rule. The road rule is still highlighted because you didn't discuss it in draft 3.1. Yeah, I'm intrigued about what we're still highlighting that we haven't discussed in 3.1. Um, but uh, generally in this section of lo location-based jurisdiction, uh, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29, um, you know, these are part of 
Um, talking about pages or lines or no nope, sections. Yeah, section. yep, sections under location-based jurisdiction. We have a section by section that Ellen gave us. Just generally speaking, both those future land use maps. Really looking for a pretty broad discussion about implementation and timeline. <clears throat> Go ahead, Ellen. Uh, timeline? No. Oh. Okay. All right. So, um, I I think you heard a you had some testimony on the road rule. Um, it's it was proposed in the NRP's report. Um, and so the language that he is here is a construct of the road rule that this. Uh, this, all right, let, let me take a step back. This committee passed a road rule in one of its prior Act 250 bills. And then when it went over to the Senate, the Senate spent more time working on that. And I believe that was in 2020 or 2021. And so this language is taken from that because the NRB report didn't um, provide, you know, specific language on any of these things. So this is a prior version of the road rule that has been worked on in the legislature. Um, as you continue to work on it, I actually have some language tweaks that may be necessary, but here's what this current version says. So this is a jurisdictional trigger. So the construction of a road, roads, driveway or driveways, which in combination is greater than 2000 feet, or the construction of any single road or driveway greater than 800 feet, to provide access to or within a tract or tracts of land of more than one acre owned or controlled by a person. So I'll stop quickly. Uh, the NRB report recommended a 2000 foot road, 2000 foot road rule. Of, I think there have also been conversations about 800 single foot road. That's why it's in bold. Um, the, and we should, I should maybe come back with additional information, but the prior road rule that was repealed in 2001 was an 800 foot road rule. So a road rule existed from 1975 to, to 2002 before it was repealed and it was an 800 foot road rule. Um, so the rest of the language I'm gonna read through is explaining what is involved in all of this, because there's additional information provided in the rest of the highlighted text. Yes. So uh, on line 13, a person, does that literally mean a person? Could it be a corporation or like, what does that mean? The definition of person is used in all the other Act 250 jurisdictional triggers and it is defined for Act 250 in 6001, but it does include, it is more than a natural person. Um, I can read it to you if you'd like. Yeah. Just let her finish. I think it'll clarify. That's what a natural person is. So uh, I'm not a natural person. I was being uh, overly simplistic, uh, but uh... Can I, can I get you the definition of person? Correct. Okay. So it, it does include more it's than, it doesn't, yes, partnerships, all of that. Legal definition. Yeah. It's in our rules. It's in the rule. Okay, sorry, it's in the rule. Yeah. And it has been litigated. So, um, yeah, so it is more than just a human. All right, so then on line 14, there's language in bold. So the intent of this subdivision is to minimize fragmentation of the landscape and encourage the clustering of buildings. So um, we need to talk about this because other jurisdictional triggers don't include intent language, but I've been having a hard time capturing the discussion about why you're adding this. And so I think this is relevant information, but whether or not it should actually be captured here, I think is a an open question legally, but I think some of the things that you have been discussing and some of the, this doesn't reflect directly what's in the NRB report, but that is part of the 
discussion about why you would add a jurisdictional trigger regarding construction of roads. Okay, so for purposes of determining jurisdiction under this subdivision. Representative Spilio has a question. Yeah. Ellen, I want to make sure I understand the question that you just posed. Can you walk through that again? For someone who has limited knowledge of this. So there is a proposal in the NRB report to add a jurisdictional trigger for a road rule. Um, and I, they did not provide language on that, right. but there has been information discussed through your witnesses about why you would add that. And so in trying to draft a road rule to reflect the intention, and, and I, I don't think this committee has fully discussed all of those elements yet, in trying to capture the elements of the discussion from some of the people you've heard from, I added intent language here, which is not typical to do. So you may consider legally if that is a place you want to add that, or if in the rest of this, dis dis uh, in, this, in the rest of the language on this road rule, if there's a way to capture how to avoid fragmentation of the landscape or require the clustering of buildings. I mean, we asked Ellen to do that. I did, I specifically, I did. So the flag is around the intent language versus something that is more specific. Which Just whether, may... whether the intent belongs here or not. Yeah, okay. agree, yeah. You know, agree with the intent, where does it go? Um, and so this is a policy decision point of discussion that we need to have. And, you know, folks have questions about the road rule, we'll ask them thoughts, what are, where, is, where are members at now? Uh, is it a seventh? Um, <clears throat> I find it helpful that the, you know, NRB discussion and report did say, hey, this is this would be a helpful tool. I think we heard a lot of uh, testimony to that effect as well. I think the question has really been, what is the appropriate distance? Um, and I just keep having to remind myself that this doesn't mean the person can't build. It means they would have to go through a review process. And um, so, I, again, I don't really know the 2,800. I feel like I have to go outside and walk or something like that. I know we've talked about it and I looked on Google Maps and I was like, oh, it's if I kind of go to the bookstore at the end of the street. Um, but generally I I lean towards supporting this. Football fields can help a lot. Eh, let me. Yeah, or starting from the DMV all the way to Sarducci's oh. is 2000. So, which is like outside, like, so yeah, depending on if you, like where you started, like if you started up here at this, the state house and that went down, but. And yeah. we have some map examples from the NRC. I had a couple of them done as we were over the summer talking about this. Um, and so we, I can share those with folks. Um, Representative Smith. Thank you. This section here appears to me and I'd like to be corrected if I'm wrong, that this will allow municipalities or the state to build any length of road they want and do whatever they want. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, why did you say no? How um, wrong am I? Okay, well, so... And you know where I'm going with it. We do. We do. Road into a certain publicly owned property. Um, so I, all right. Oh, shh. Maybe the way to say it is how does this affect town roads? Is that what you're trying to What's figure that? out? How does this affect a town, a public road? Well, no, I'm just wondering. This appears to me that it gives the state permission to build roads longer than 2,000 feet whenever they want. So, and all that's doing is legalizing what they've already done, in my opinion. So under Act 250 currently, the state or municipality has to go through Act 250 if they disturb more than 10 acres of land in their construction. And so VTRANS, when they construct roads, regularly go through Act 250. 
Um, and so that's not changing under this provision. Um, this, depending on how you decide the language <clears throat> will be, um, it may or may not reduce the size of the road before they specifically trigger Act 250. So they do already trigger Act 250. Um, and as we previously mentioned, most Act 250 permits are granted. So, um, but it's setting the level at which there is Act 250 oversight of the construction of a road. So, um, I don't, you can be specific here about if you want there to be a distinction for roads built by municipalities or the state. Well, what I'm saying here, and I'm sorry to take too, so much time on this, but it says routine maintenance shall not include the changing of the size of the road, the changing the location of the layout of the road, and routine maintenance shall include replacing a culvert or ditch, applying new stone grading and making repairs. Now, this does not apply or it doesn't make it legal to upgrade what might have been a, a trail and was never a legal town road, does it? If there's no road there, they're not upgrading or maintaining a legal road. Or, uh, this is probably yes. going to take more time than, than <laughs> you want to allow for, Madam Chair. But my point is that a road was built under the auspices or under the claim that it was being that it was rebuilding a road of oh. what was once there mm -hmm. and it was not a road that was once there it was a logging road that somebody used to cross land with so i might suggest that we finish walking through the language and have legislative council help us understand it and then ask questions yeah i would i would like to yeah get some help on this because i'm going to get to the bottom of something that happened even okay. if i'm 90 when i get it done so um, you, on the road rule, um, I'm shuffling back through here. Did we hear from any developers or housing um, house house serves on this road rule language? I can't recall who we heard on this. Um, well, we heard, I think, from many. I'm trying to get to most, if not all, of the members of the NRB working group. Um, oops represented the folks and or are those so we can go back and see from a lot of people so okay i would like to make sure that we hear from a someone who builds for now i need to go through language and talk about it <laughs> it's just a short thing i, I don't want to lose sight of this uh to brian's defense there were some exceptions under the Act 250. One of them was educational, one of them was municipalities. No. Okay. I, I just want to be clear on that. So we're talking, I was talking about something entirely different. So there is an exemption. So municipalities, it is a greater threshold for them to currently reach Act 250 jurisdiction. And currently under Act 250, just just the construction of a road may not trigger Act 250. Unless, unless okay. it meets the the ten acre th ten acre threshold. Once you're in, once you're in Act Two Fifty, there are criteria specifically five, six, and seven, which are traffic, municipal services, and education, on which a permit cannot be denied. So that's separate. And then there's language proposing a new road rule because there was a road rule that was a that was repealed. So currently. Just constructing a road, if it doesn't hit the 10 acre threshold, does not trigger Act 250 jurisdiction. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, did we take testimony on why that road rule was repealed? Um, I haven't been following your, I did, but I do think Brian Shoup provided some information. Um, oh, or John Groveman. Some. Okay. Um, but you, I have researched the road rule, um, and so I can also provide some information regarding the prior road rule at some point, if you'd like.
Okay, so on page 45. Construction or road to road, 2,000 feet or single road of 800 feet. Provide access to or within a tract of tractor land of more than one acre under controlled by a person. For purposes of determining jurisdiction under this subdivision, any tract or tract of land that will be provided access by the road or driveway is involved land. As used in this subdivision, road shall include any new road or upgrade of a class four highway by a person other than a municipality, including a road that will be transferred to or maintained by, onto page 46, a municipality after its construction or upgrade. For purposes of this subdivision two, routine maintenance of a class four or stormwater improvement required under 1264 uh, of Title 10 shall not constitute an upgrade. Routine maintenance shall include replacing a culvert or ditch, applying new stone, grading, or making repairs after adverse weather. Routine maintenance shall not include changing the size of the road, changing the location or layout of the road, or adding pavement. For purposes of determining the length under this subdivision, the length of all roads and driveways within the tract or tracts of land shall be included. This subdivision shall not apply to a road constructed for a municipal, county, or state purpose, a utility corridor of an electricity of an electric transmission or distribution company or a road located entirely within a designated downtown or neighborhood development area, and a road primarily used for farming or forestry purposes unless used for residential purpose. So there's a lot of stuff in this. And so Representative Smith, I maybe, my answer was probably confusing. So the, the road rule, that's the, the language that's on this page addresses some issues that have come up previously with the road rule in determining what is a road and whether or not Act 250 jurisdiction should apply to it. So it's saying that uh, up, uh, routine maintenance of a road is not going to trigger Act 250 jurisdiction, but routine maintenance doesn't include changing the size or location of the road or paving it. It does, however, exempt count, municipal or county or state roads. So, Representative Smith, so I'm, I, I, I don't know if I answered your question accurately because uh, it you didn't yet. You didn't yet. Right. So I don't. So this is intended to apply to private roads and the construction of private roads. Because public roads already have, there's Act 250 jurisdiction over the roads constructed by a town or the state under their jurisdictional trigger for 10 or more acres of disturbed land. Um, so I think I confused the issue a minute ago, so I'm sorry. But there's specificity here that it, we're talking about a private road routine maintenance of that road is not triggering Act 250, but expanding the road or upgrading the road would trigger Act 250. Um, but then utility corridors, farming and logging roads, and roads located in exempt areas would not trigger Act 250 jurisdiction. So uh, this prior version referenced designated downtown and neighborhood development areas because it's a few iterations behind, but it may want to say tier one or just tier one. I don't know. I just read about this language from. Uh, this is from, I think, H 926 of 2020. So your committee passed language in 2020 on a road rule, and then the Senate further worked on it and um, specifically talked a lot about grading and culverts and added some of that specific language about routine maintenance. Because um, I think when VNRC was in there, they showed you the language that you had passed out of this committee in H926. 
Um, and this language is very similar to it. It just added some additional detail around the routine maintenance piece. So why is it tied to the size of the parcel? Um, well, it's a one acre limit. And so that is currently in Act 250 um, related to, uh, you know, one acre towns. So I think the original road rule, I, I don't know. I mean, you have lots of options here. Um, the original road rule did use more than one acre of land also. So, yeah. And Bob, that comment, it probably is not likely that somebody would build a really long road to the little bank line. It's less likely. Um, but my, my question, Ellen, is the, the reason, you know, we just track language and we take a look at is the, the intent of the sub, subdivision to minimize fragmentation is to minimize fragmentation of the landscape and curves and cluster buildings was because we, not that everybody talks about that being the intent, but we never said it anywhere. And so, and I understand your point, by the way, I'm not arguing the point, but um, if this language were in here, would this give, does the board have the, but that language there to indicate the purpose of the section, does the board, would the board have the inherent authority to adopt the rule or the section that would uh, bring effect to that? Um, I think so. So the board has really broad re rulemaking authority under their existing statute. Um, and the original road rule was a rule um, that they adopted on their own accord. Um, so you could put a directive in here for them to adopt rules. I think they would have authority to adopt the rules on their own if they wanted to. Are uh, electric transmission lines right here, or are they covered elsewhere? Is that why, to assumably they're not, they're excluded here? It's, they're regulated in some other? Well, right, so section 248 does cover electric transmission lines and the associated infrastructure. So I can't remember specifically off the top of my head if roads are specifically identified as a ancillary infrastructure for a transmission line, but I suspect. It does seem as though that could easily cause fragmentation. Wow. Those are pretty wide, I mean, even, even more so than a road to someone's home. Yeah, they can be. Um, and, um, I'm also wondering if, 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 if a property owner constructs a, a, a road for logging, and then at a, that's longer than 800 feet, and then at a later date, which is to put a house at the end of that road, that house placement would then come under Act 250 using these guidelines, using this language? Yes, so if you look at, uh, the language specifically on um, the last, the very last clause. So I think that that is a common scenario that, and that has been considered previously. So a road that is primarily used for farming or, or forestry purposes is not part of this road rule unless it is used for residential purpose. So I think that if a road was constructed for logging purposes and then became a residential road, it could be jurisdictional and require an Act 250 permit. Now, one of the things that is still in flux, so this is kind of a first draft language because I haven't heard direct feedback on all of your intent yet, but prior versions of the road rule have also included um, with the within a, a number of years provision. So it's not in this one. 
Um, but like on line 12, there was in this draft a uh, date after which there was, it would be perspective. So you have a lot of options here as you're making the policy decision to sort of tell me what you want to include, whether or not you only want it to be prospective applying to newly constructed roads. If there should be a, a number of years after which it resets. So like in the construction of housing units, it's within five years, within five miles. And that's sort of to avoid people spreading out their projects so that they can avoid jurisdiction. This, you could say, uh, you know, all length of road constructed within a 10 year period. And if it some distant time down the road, sorry, at some distant point in the future, a house was added, perhaps that doesn't need to trigger Act 250, but this right now just says there isn't a time frame on it. So once this goes into effect, any road construction at any point, once it reaches the 2,000 or 800 foot limit would require an Act 250 permit. So there's a, a lot of variables in this that I do think you have to sort of pay close attention to so that they reflect exactly your intent. And do, do, do forest roads cause fragmentation? I don't know if I can answer that. It's my, my point in asking that question is that if, if they do, then one could argue that by simply at a later <laughs> the house at the end of that road, that they haven't actually made the situation any worse, that the fragmentation has already occurred. And, and so now we can put a house there and there. And if you could do that, then you could build long roads into forests for forestry purposes and then put a home on it. And all our language in creating this road rule undercut. I think your point's well taken. I mean that 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 the fragmenting effect of it, um, but it's also uh, it's dependent on the amount of use the road gets and where the road is located and the resources that exist on the site that are being impacted. House with yard. <clears throat> yeah, people living there year round would have a different impact than. Logging every 20 years, for example, might have. Yeah. And then my other question is um, how ancient roads, how lots of ancient roads fit into this, if they, if they do. Like a, a, an old public right of way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Believe question. Yeah, so one of the things that is interesting about this entire concept mm -hmm. is that Road itself isn't actually defined. There is a distinction made between a road, like road, it does cover both roads and driveways. Um, so you could be more specific and include more information about these other access trails, paths. And I guess I'll point out for the committees to ponder over their lunch break, but um, you know, this still has section seven above it, which is sort of a 500 foot buffer version of, as Representative Stebbins is what we need to decide on, but, and also the approach, um, and it's focused on distance from publicly maintained roads. And then assuming that the town's commitment to those roads drive some version of an economic analysis either before they're made public or um, as they have to maintain them is one of the intents there thinking about overall costs of these types of roads if that makes sense um, and i guess i'm gonna peter gill if i may ask you um, how were there other, um, I think, um, if you could give a little history of the road rule, but also um, any other rules that were related to it uh, would be very helpful for us standing. I don't know if you can do any of that 
now, or if you can bring that back when you bring back the other information. Add it still does. Yeah, that's probably the best approach. Okay. Right. Right. Um, I can tell you um, that when the board originally came up with the rule in 1975, um, they did amend it quite a few times before it was repealed in 2001. Um, and so I haven't, I haven't looked at if there were any other associated rules, but it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lines long. So it was one, two, three, four, five sentences long. And uh, the language that I have drafted incorporates a lot of what was there, but then provides additional detail on that. So I don't know if it would be helpful for me to read you the last road rule from 2001. Sure. Um, and I can, I can get you this. So the 2001 version uh, was the construction of improvements for a road or roads incidental to the sale or lease of land to provide access to or within a tract of land of more than one acre owned or controlled by a person. In municipalities with both permanent and zoning and subdivision bylaws, this jurisdiction shall apply only if the tract or tract of land involved is more than 10 acres. For purposes of determining jurisdiction, any parcel of land which will be provided access by the road is land involved in construction. This jurisdiction shall not apply unless the road is provide the road provides access to more than five parcels or is more than 800 feet in length. Sorry, did I trip over that? The jurisdiction shall not apply unless the road is to provide access to more than four parcels, sorry, more than five parcels or 800 feet in length. So that was the trigger. Was it 800 feet in length or were there gonna be five parcels having access to the road? For purposes of determining the length of the road, the length of all other roads within the tract of land constructed within a continuous period of 10 years, commencing after the effective date of this rule shall be included. So I did try to address most, mo many of the elements that are in here, but then also as the committees have worked on this in pre prior sessions, provide additional fine scale detail. Um, there were issues with the prior road rule um, and administering it and Really, it was, yes, a lot of things came up about like, what is routine maintenance of a road? When does it become a road? So um, what is a driveway? Is that different than a road? And so some of that is reflected in what you have in your draft before you to address some of the issues that came up with it 25 years ago. Um, and so that your the version in this draft doesn't make a distinction between a 10 acre or one acre town, but it does set a minimum parcel size of one acre. It doesn't speak to whether or not there needs to be a minimum of five parcels. It doesn't speak to whether or not it's within a continuous period of 10 years. So there are some differences in this draft than what the prior road rule was. Um, but then it also does, as I mentioned, provide greater detail about the routine maintenance aspect and, and those other types of various roads that could come up, like logging roads and farming roads. And, yeah. If you could, is it easy for you to send us that, take a picture and send it to us or something? Yeah. thoughts on the road rule right now representatives so to so just want to make sure i understand where we are with the road which is we've made no decisions right we're going to hear back from the nrb hopefully soon this week can you come back on friday yeah great thank you hey so the next change is on page 48. Yeah. <laughs> and Alan's giving me the look. It's, uh, I don't know, kind of 12. It's. And there's a big section. Yeah, representative seven. 
Do you mind if I just ask for a little bit more clarification in section seven yeah. that has the 500 feet language yeah. that we yeah. just do? Yeah. Because I, I understand the 2000 feet or 800. Um, I don't really understand the 500 feet. Is that basically saying if you're building a home 500 feet from the road, then yeah. you would trigger Act 250? Yes. Uh, yep. Can you just say that again slower? Yeah. I do things. I'm gonna let Ellen say it. Sure. If you're building a if you're building something that is going to be located more than 500 feet from the center line of an existing road. This is a driveway versus a road, basically. Yeah, it's less than a tenth of an acre. I mean a half of a mile. What? Five hundred feet? Yeah. Oh. Uh, this is agnostic about whether or not you're actually constructing a road or driveway. So it really is about the construction of a home and how far you are from an existing road. Public road. Public road. But I think it's actually not just restrained to a home. Sorry, yeah, I said that the first time. It's commercial, industrial, residential. Playground. Yeah. Um, critical infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, so so critical. Yeah. So yeah. critical infrastructure is defined. Um, this is not a municipal trigger. This is for commercial, industrial, residential use, municipal or state construction. Okay. As a different tr jurisdictional trigger, okay. But but electric utilities are not a municipal or state entity necessarily. Representative Morris, okay. Madam Chair, and I'm wondering, <clears throat> this is. The road rule is very descriptive and I know it has been controversial with people. And we have uh, version A, version B here, with 500 from the center line and then the 2000 foot plus the 800 foot single road. I didn't know if we had any flavor or diet and may, this might come into the discussion side, maybe doesn't need an answer now. But if we just determined that we wanted the 2000 foot maximum aggregate road and then have the ANR or natural resources uh, create the rules around that. Instead I mean, of us putting it into. Yeah, the environmental board. Yeah. It's, I'm sorry, it's natural resource board now, but it would be the environmental review board. Yeah, I that's a thought of, for sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. I think we'll break for lunch and we're reconvening one o'clock. We're at a different topic. Representative Bong. Just because we're picking up on mm -hmm. Representative Wait, you actually could also do both. You could have, we could fill in part of the board, still adopt the top of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Can you say that again? Sorry. Well, oh, down here. this one. You could direct them to adopt rules. Um, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know how many rules currently sort of flesh out the jurisdictional triggers themselves. Mm -hmm. This is an unusual case, um, but guidance, I think, has been used for some of the jurisdictional triggers, but I don't know if there's any rules directly associated with, except maybe utility lines. Trails and utility lines. Um, so otherwise, most of the other jurisdictional triggers don't necessarily have a rule associated with them also. But you could potentially do that. All right. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. We will um, take a break. break until lunch. I mean, until lunch. Okay. Further the way through. Yes.
representative really, yeah. uh, well, but compared to highlighting even the there isn't much highlighting this being possible to hear from um the utilities or representative of the utilities about this proposed language i'd like us to hear that yeah. okay. all right we are adjourned for the morning